Romans 5, verse 12 says this, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that we would live in his abundant grace that we would rejoice in what you've done. Help us now as we would read this and learn it through your word. We ask that you teach us by your spirit. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As Christmas rapidly approaches, the thoughts of a lot of people turn to presents, gifts. Spent time with some of the kids uh, last Sunday and asking them about Christmas, and that's the very first thing that's on their mind, of course. They dream about the presents they want, and parents spend a lot of time and a lot of money trying to get them the presents that they want. Couples, even if you don't have kids, they want to try to find each other the perfect gift. And even when somebody says, well, you know, I don't want much wrapped under the tree, just, you know, whatever. Well, you still want to give them an experience full of memories. Now, obviously, this can be taken in unhealthy and unbiblical ways, but I do want to say in one sense, Christmas is about the perfect gift because it's the gift from God to the world of Jesus, his only begotten son. And the babe who laid in the manger is the best gift because it's only through Jesus and his work, which at that time was then future cross and resurrection. It's only through him that we can be given eternal life and the salvation of God from our sins. And it's this gift that Paul describes in his letter to the Romans. Not from a Christmas perspective, of course, this isn't a Christmas message, but it is from a perspective of contrasts. Mankind has received two very different gifts from two representatives of the human race. One gave death, thanks. <laughs> the other gives life. Which gift are we abiding in? How did we get here? Well, when it came to the gospel, Paul showed that there's both bad news and good news. Bad news, we've all sinned, we've fallen short of the glory of God, and because of that, we all deserve God's judgment. The good news is that God provided an answer in Jesus, because Jesus gave himself as a substitute sacrifice for us. Now everyone who believes in him can be justified by faith. That is great news. What makes it so good? Well, we spent the last couple of weeks in chapter 5 talking about that. It's good because of the benefits we receive in Christ. It's good because of the, the men and women we become in Jesus Christ. It's good because of the work that Jesus did in his death. It's good because of the work that Jesus does in his resurrection. Again, all of the very first half of chapter 5. We've been forever reconciled to God, having become the recipients of his infinite love demonstrated through Jesus' death at the cross. That's good, good news. Now, at this point, the question becomes, why was all of this necessary in the first place? Now, we might accept the fact that we are all sinners, as we read about Romans chapters 1 through 3. But more foundationally, why is there sin? How did we start sinning? How did we get to the point that we actually became the enemies of God, requiring his reconciliation? Well, this is where Paul next turns his attention. And he contrasts two men and their acts. Adam 
and Jesus. Both men in their divinely appointed roles gave gifts to mankind vastly different from one another. One gave sin, one gives grace. Now, thankfully, the gift of Jesus' grace is far greater than our inheritance of Adam's sin. Now, as we read through it today, and as you probably read through it before, it can seem like you know, the organization of this latter half of chapter 5 can seem kind of convoluted. We'll see this all in three basic ways. Number one, we'll see the problem of Adam's sin, and that answers the question, what happened? Second, we'll see the hope of Jesus' gift. That answers the question, what does he offer? Then we'll see, finally, the result of Jesus' gift, and that answers the question, what does Jesus do? Jesus gives us a wonderful gift in his grace. We want to receive it. We want to rejoice in it. So we start with this problem of Adam's sin in verses 12 through 14. What happened? What brought us to this point? Well, verse 12 says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Now, before we get to anything else, don't miss this. There was a literal historical Adam. The book of Genesis and the origin of the universe has become a stumbling block for a lot of people when it comes to the Bible. And so many people, including many Christians, they write off the first few chapters of Genesis as being mythological, symbolic, and ultimately unimportant. And we need to note that neither Paul nor Jesus does so. Now, Jesus is not recorded in the Gospels as quoting Adam by name, referring to him by name, but he certainly referred to Adam and Eve as being historical when he was talking about the covenant of marriage, what God has joined together, let not man separate. We read that in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. For Paul, what we see here, not only in Romans, but in other books of the Bible, by the way, and Paul, the historicity of Adam is essential, especially when talking about the doctrine of original sin, which is what we're talking about here today. Without a first human made in the image of God, we have no starting point for the first sin, and that drastically affects what Jesus offers in his sacrificial gift. And that's really the subject of the rest of the chapter here. So it means that those first few chapters in Genesis are vitally important. They're historical. They're true. Those who hold, by the way, to a literal interpretation of Genesis 1 through 3 do not abandon science to do so. Now, it's commonplace to see people hold up science and the scripture as being opposites, but that's not the case at all. Now, Darwinism, that's at odds with the Bible. But Darwinism is not the whole of science. It's a set of assumptions that's held to with religious fervor by those who look to explain the origins of the universe and origins of life without God. We need to know that all kind of assumptions have come and gone throughout the centuries. So Darwinism is just next in line, and eventually that will be done away with as well. By the way, before we leave this, some people do ask, because they do question this, does somebody have to believe in a literal interpretation of Genesis 1 through 3 in order to be saved? Not necessarily, though I would argue their theology is dramatically weakened, as well as the view of the rest of the Bible because you, you weaken the foundations of it. Now, it is an essential doctrine along the lines of the deity of Christ is essential. The substitution that he gave at the cross is essential. His resurrection is essential. It's not essential, but it is very, very important. And its importance is at the core of what Paul is showing here at the latter half of Romans chapter 5. So should we hold to a literal interpretation of Genesis 1 through 3? Yes, we should. We have very good theological reasons for doing so. Now, with the knowledge that a literal Adam existed, what about him? Why is he important to the gospel? Well, Paul sets up his argument. He says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. So he's speaking of the fall, of course. He's speaking of the first sin. Adam had been given a command by the Lord God, and Adam disobeyed. And because it becomes so important to us, let's look at what happened. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And that's crystal clear. And God doesn't leave any wiggle room. We like wiggle room when it comes to sin, because we think if I can have a little bit of space over here, then I can push it right up to the edge and not sin. God left no wiggle room whatsoever right here. Now, as we remember from the rest of the story in chapter 3, Satan, who was disguised as a serpent, came and he deceived Eve. 
And not only did she eat of the forbidden fruit, by the way, we don't know that it's an apple. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. Don't shun your apples as thinking that they're evil. <laughs> but she gave it to her husband, Adam, and he ate of it as well. The very thing God specifically commanded Adam not to do, he did. That's the essence of sin. God tells us to do something. We say, no, we're going to choose our own way. That's sin. And this is the foundational and the very first sin that entered mankind. From beginning from this point in time, uh, you know, humans were no longer innocent regarding sin. There was a moment, a brief moment in time, that humans were innocent regarding sin, but that innocence is forever removed. Of all the firsts in the book of Genesis, and there are a lot, this was surely one of the worst. By the way, some people would ask the question, well, if sin entered the world at this time, what about Satan? Satan surely fell before Adam, considering Satan was the one who tempted Adam to sin. Didn't Satan's sin precede that of Adam's? Well, yes, but that's not Paul's point in Romans 5, okay? Paul's whole context is what takes place with humanity, right? Satan's sin was the first sin among all creation, but Adam's sin was the very first sin among the world of men. Okay, so that's the context here. That's one tragic first, by the way, sin entered the world. The second tragic first in Genesis 1 through 3 was that of death. And Paul writes it, from that first sin came death. From death, right, death came through sin, uh, because that's part and parcel of the commandment of God to Adam. Uh, if Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what would be the result? You shall surely die. Came right with the commandment. By the way, the Hebrew leaves absolutely no uncertainty about the consequence that would come to Adam if and when he disobeyed. When Adam ate the fruit, he would never have thought that, well, if I eat this, maybe God was wrong. Maybe I misunderstood him. Maybe there's something else I didn't consider in my interpretation. No, Adam knew exactly what God warned him of. God warned him of certain death if he ate, yet he chose to eat anyway. Why? Because it's a human. That's what we always do. We think we know better. Death always comes with sin, both with Adam and even the garden and with us today. You know, one of the reasons that Paul can write later on that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23, oh, is right because of this. Death was the result of Adam's first sin against God, and death results with our sins against God as well. Now, thankfully, the wages of sin may be death, but the gift of God is Christ Jesus our Lord, right? Now, death is a bad enough consequence for Adam, but that's not all that happened in that moment. Paul writes that death spread to all men. We know that, you know, from the Genesis record that Adam and Eve, although they lived an incredibly long time, they died. And it wasn't just them. Every son and daughter that came after them died as well. You read Genesis chapter 1 and everything's coming into creation. Everything's good. Everything's living. Chapter 5 is the opposite. Chapter 5 is a record of death. And you get this pattern there. X begot Y. They lived for so many years, had so many sons and daughters, and then X died. Over and over and over again, you read, he died and he died and he died and he died. That's our story as well. As much as we rejoice in the birth of new sons and daughters among us, we grieve the deaths of those who have gone before us. And sometimes those things can happen exactly the same day. Why does this happen? Why do we experience death? It goes back to this very moment in Genesis. Adam sinned, Adam died, and he passed that death on to the rest of us. Well, how so? Remember that God warned Adam that in the day... In the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit, that he would surely die. Yet we know that neither Adam nor Eve dropped dead in the garden. It wasn't like Snow White where they ate the bite of the apple and then just plopped over, right? If they had, they wouldn't have had any children. We would have never come into existence. Now, they did both physically die eventually, but not right there in the moment. But they did die that day spiritually, when they were originally created, God created Adam as good, having created mankind in his own image. But after that first sin, that image is marred, and Adam spiritually died. No longer is he destined to live forever. At that moment, Adam was in need, in need of spiritual rescue and redemption. And so that's why Paul goes on to make the point that all sinned. In Adam, all men, all women, all people sinned. It wasn't just that Adam's sin brought consequences upon he and Eve alone. No, his sin drastically affected the rest of us. We're not only capable of sin because of Adam's fall, 
and we are capable of sin because of Adam's fall. But we have all sinned in Adam's fall. Think of it this way. We are not what God originally created humans to be. Our very existence falls short of the glory of God. We have original sin. That's why theologians call it original sin. The issue of sin is not just something that we commit. It's something we are, which is why we can't be so easily rid of it. It's why we have such a desperate need for Jesus. It's why no one can ever be righteous on his or her own. Because even if it were possible, it's not, but even if it were possible for someone from birth until death to live an absolutely perfect life, never committing a single sin against God, intentionally or unintentionally, that person would still have a need for redemption because that person would still have inherited a fallen sinful nature. It goes to the very core of who we are. Uh, we don't you know, we don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. We've inherited that from Adam. By the way, this is exactly why Jesus was to be born of a virgin as we celebrate at Christmas time. Adam passed his fallen nature through his seed, but what do we know about Jesus? He was not born of the seed of the man. Jesus was born of the seed of the woman. Genesis 3.15, Galatians 4.4. 4. When the Holy Spirit came upon Mary in that mysterious, miraculous way, the fallen nature of Adam was completely bypassed. Jesus was still, of course, a son of Adam in that Jesus was physically born of Mary, who was a daughter of Adam, but Jesus was truly the son of God. He was begotten of God the Father. Okay, now just in this first verse, there's a ton of theology right here. And Paul's not even done. He's just getting started. But this is foundational to everything else that he's going to write through the end of the chapter. If we don't understand how our problem with sin originated in Adam, then we won't understand the gift of grace that we have in Jesus. Now, Paul takes a few twists and turns as he gets there, but it all comes down to this point. Sin and death came through Adam, and because it did, that's why we need the gift of Jesus so badly. All right, so verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. By the way, if you're following along in New King James, and that's what I teach from, be careful with the parentheses here. And don't let it distract you. The original Greek did not have these kinds of grammatical markings. In fact, the original Greek didn't have any punctuation whatsoever. All right, the markings are put there by the translators in their attempt to try to help make sense of the grammar, and there's always going to be some interpretation involved with translation which is one reason it's important to use as much of a word-for-word -word translation as possible. But even in that, there's going to be a little bit of interpretation. So these parentheses are part of that interpretation. We can think that it doesn't really matter. We can skip over it. No, it's just Paul's taking a little twist and turn to get there. There is a little bit of digression here, at least a little bit of explanation. See, and going back to the sin of Adam, Paul has to acknowledge that the Garden of Eden preceded the law of Moses by many centuries. Many generations of people existed between Abraham and Adam, much less Moses and Adam. Yet the law was not given until Moses. Now, certainly there were covenants between God and men. We think of Noah. Uh, we think of Abraham being two prime examples. But when it came to the written law of God, sin was in the world long before the written law was. So that all begs these questions. How can sin exist without the law? How can sin be imputed to somebody without the law? In other words, if there is no legal standard, what standard is there to break, and how can anyone be held accountable to a standard that doesn't exist? That's one thing for us to go down the freeway at 90 miles an hour and be given a ticket for breaking the speed limit. Actually, if you're going down that fast, you're probably going to be taken to jail. And even if you claim, well, I didn't know the speed limit, you don't have an excuse because there is a limit. You're probably just driving too fast to read the sign. <laughs> and even if the sign wasn't there, it had fallen down or they never put it up, whatever, you're still culpable for breaking the law because the law was enacted without you even knowing the details of it. But what if there was no limit? Many parts of the German Autobahn famously have no speed limit whatsoever, and you can't get a speeding ticket when there is no limit. When there is no law, there is no imputation of sin. Now, take it back to Paul's statement about the law of God. If that hadn't yet been written, how could people be imputed with guilt? The answer, the formal law of Moses did not exist until Mount Sinai, but the moral law of God has always existed. You might recall, we've been studying through this very slowly, of course, but this was a major point of discussion in Romans chapters 1 and 2. 
Roman chapter 1, we learn that creation testifies of the existence of God and the attributes of God, revealing God's wrath against the unrighteousness and the lawlessness of men. Men and women don't have to read a Bible to know that there is a righteous God. All we need to do is look outside and open up our eyes. In Romans chapter 2, we learn that even Gentiles without a written law, well, we still have the law of God written on our hearts or our conscience bear witness against us when we sin. And this is why there's universal standards of right and wrong found in every culture around the world. Murder's always wrong, rape's always wrong, that sort of thing. Because the law of God is written on our hearts. And so men and women who've never read the scriptures, who've never even heard of Moses, still know some of these basic truths about God. All right, that takes us back to Romans chapter 5. How can sin be imputed without the law? Well, Adam and his immediate descendants, they did not have the law of Moses, but they still knew the moral law of God. The moral standard of God existed prior to the Mosaic law, but that's proven through one simple fact. What is it? Well, because people were dying left and right. The existence of death, right? Death comes through sin. So we see the consequence of sin. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Death reigned despite a lack of the formal written law. The record of humanity is a record of death. Again, go back and read Genesis chapter 5. And if you don't want to do that, just go peruse your local cemetery. Uh, record of mankind is a record of death. The old cliche is that you know, two things are certain in life, death and taxes. If you're rich enough, you'll find a way to avoid the taxes, but you'll never find a way to avoid death. Death comes to all of us, regardless of diet, disease, wealth, or anything else. If there's one statistic that's unwaveringly true, it's one out of one people die. Death rate always 100%. And by the way, since death is certain, it means you better be ready. Because too many people are not. They live their lives without considering the certain fact that one day they will die. And they pretend like death's going to happen to anybody else, everybody else except me. So you need to ask yourself if you're ready. Do you know what's going to happen to you when you die? Do you know what you're going to say to God when you see him on judgment day? And if you aren't 100% certain that you will spend eternal life with God in heaven because of Christ Jesus, then you do not have any certainty at all. And who can afford to gamble with something as important as eternal life? The question, of course, is between heaven or hell, and you can be certain of heaven when you put your faith in Jesus. And I would implore you to do so. Keep in mind, uh, we don't have to sin exactly like Adam sinned, in order to see, receive the same punishment of death that Adam received. Adam, we see here, he disobeyed a direct command from God, or as many people, maybe they've never you know, read the Bible, or they've never heard a direct command from God. And you say, well, even so, they still die. Why? Because they still sin. Both through that original sin of Adam and through their own sinful acts, they still engage in acts of transgression against the moral law of God. And again, you know, Paul made the point, Romans 1 through 3, we've all sinned, we're all left without excuse. We're all in this terrible position as a human race. We're desperate to be rescued. Now, thankfully, Paul's going to write about that rescue next, right? By the way, before we get there, what does it mean that Adam is a type, a type of him who is to come? Obviously, speaking of Jesus, it means that there are certain similarities between the two, imperfectly seen in Adam, but perfectly seen in Jesus. And we see some of these theological types throughout the Bible. I'll give you a couple examples. Joseph. Joseph can be seen as a type of Christ because he was rejected by his brothers, sent to the equivalent of death, but he rose up to this highly exalted position to provide salvation to Israel. So there's a type. We see a type in Melchizedek the priest. Uh, he can be seen as a type of Christ, if not actually the pre-incarnate Christ himself. But we see him described in Hebrews as being without beginning or without end. He served as both king and priest of the Most High God. We see it actually also in Moses. Moses can be seen as a type of Christ because he leads the nation of Israel. He gives forth the word of God. He serves as a mediator between God and the people. And many other examples can be found in the Bible. We want to be careful, by the way, not to push it too far. Uh, some theologians look for types behind every single word in the Bible, and there's no reason to do so. We don't want to push an interpretation on Scripture. But the bottom line here for Adam being a type of Jesus is this. Both men serve as the theological term, federal heads, representatives, right? They serve as representatives of humanity in similar ways, although they offer different things. Adam came before us 
He committed the first sin, and He condemned us all to a sinful nature. Jesus came before us, covering our original sin, offering us the gift of eternal life. And just as Adam affected all of humanity, so Jesus affects all those who put their faith in Him. Adam was a type of Jesus, but Jesus is the better than Adam. All right, so let's get back to the foundational issue. What was the problem? What happened when Adam sinned? Well, when Adam sinned, we all sinned. Because Adam died, we all die. That's what he gave us as, his, as our federal head. That's a big problem. What hope do we have? Do we have any hope? Yes. What Jesus offers. And that's the next section here in verses 15 through 17. This is the hope of Jesus' gift. The hope of Jesus' gift. What is it that he offers? Verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. See, Jesus offers a gift. He offers a gift. Death was imposed on us. Death was mandated by this sinful fallen nature we inherited from Adam. We don't have a choice when it comes to sin and death. We have it. That's just the way it is. But not so with the gift of God. Jesus offers a gift of rescue. He offers a free gift, one that cannot be earned, bought, nor stolen. Either we freely receive it as a gift from Jesus or we do not receive it at all. Think of it. It's not really a gift if you purchase it for yourself. We all have that one Christmas present that we want that nobody buys for us. So we go out on December 26th on Amazon or wherever, and we buy it for ourselves. Come on, that's not a present, that's a purchase. It's no different from any other purchase you would make, you just you do it on Christmas Day or the day after. The only way it's a gift is if somebody buys it for you. Likewise, if you've got to do something to earn it, it's not a gift. Your boss does not graciously give you a gift every 1st and 15th that he signs your paycheck. No, that's something you've earned. By the way, even when you get a bonus, that's not a gracious gift, you've earned that too. See, the point is, that's not the way salvation works. Jesus gives a gift. And any attempt we make to earn it both misses the point of it being a gift, and it insults the one giving it to us. Have you ever insulted a friend or a family member or a host when you've been over as a guest, and you refuse to accept their gift? They're trying to give it to you, and you, just, you insist to pay for it? It's insulting. That's what people do with Jesus when they try to purchase his free gift of salvation through mindless religious ritual or, or good deeds. Jesus gives a gift. Can't purchase it. We can only receive it through faith. What's the gift? The gift is grace, is what Paul writes here. What we need most is what Jesus freely offers. Because of Adam, we face death. But that's what grace opposes. Through the offense, or through the trespass, another translation of this, through the offense of Adam, many died. And many, I know, everyone died. But the free gift of Jesus isn't like that. The free gift of Jesus is better than the offense. The free gift of Jesus is the abundant grace of God. Now, you notice the contrast here, both in verse 15 and, and the verses following. It's going to be all kinds of contrast between the offense of Adam and the gift of Jesus. The gift is different. The gift is better. We're all saddled with the offense, but we have this opportunity to receive this wonderful gift. We want the gift. Verse 16, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So the offense brings judgment and condemnation. The gift brings justification. The offense of Adam brought judgment to us. The offense of Adam brought culpability for sin. Not only did we sin in Adam, we inherited a nature that causes us to sin on our own. And so we not only rightly receive the judgment he passed down to us, but we also receive the judgment that we've earned all by ourselves through all the many offenses and trespasses that we commit every single day. We received Adam's condemnation and we earned our own condemnation. But that's in Adam. In Jesus, we get something better. In Jesus, we receive justification. In Jesus' gift, he offers us a righteousness we never had. We spoke about this in depth when we were in Romans chapter 4. Our spiritual bank accounts were empty. We were spiritually destitute the moment we were born. But Jesus offers to fill it to the full with his own righteousness. And Jesus' gift not only covers the original offense of Adam, 
but it covers the many offenses we committed on our own. And so when Jesus offers to make us right, to justify us in the sight of God, he justifies us completely. What does this look like? Look at verse 17. For by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. With the offense, death reigns. Again, death reigned from Adam to Moses and from Moses to everyone else. As long as people live in the offense of Adam, the only thing that awaits us is death. It truly reigns, it rules over every man and woman, and not a single person can escape its reach. But with the gift, life reigns. Or rather, those who receive the gift, Paul writes, will reign in life. For those who receive the gift of Jesus, though we will certainly face death, death is not the end. So that means death does not rule over us. It's conquered. For those who receive the gift of Jesus, the sting of death is removed. How so? Because with the gift of the grace of God comes eternal life. So yes, we're going to face death. We'll taste it for a moment. But in Jesus, we will live and we will never taste death again. Now, for those outside of Christ, they'll be subjected to death forever, both in this life and in eternal hell, which the Bible terms the second death. But for those in Christ, we will reign forever with our Savior. And guys, that's not just a little grace, is it? That is, like Paul says, it's an abundance of grace. It's an overflowing of grace. It's an outpouring of grace. It's a showering of grace. It's a gift of righteousness. How wonderful is the gift of Jesus and how tragic it is when it's refused. So we're offered this incredible hope in Jesus. Adam's sin leaves us in this really bleak state. Jesus offers his gift. It's amazing. He presents us a gift that showers us with the grace of God, justifies us fully from our original sin, promises us eternal life in heaven. You can't get any better than that. You say, it sounds so good. Is it only a hope? Jesus offers us that hope. Is it only a wish? Is it only good feelings? No, there are real results from what Jesus has done. And that's how Paul ends out chapter five. He's talking about the results of Jesus' gift, what it is that he does. Verse 18, therefore, love that word, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. By the way, real results are needed because we have a real problem. And not only did Adam's sin bring sin and death to all of us, it brought condemnation. The guilt we receive from Adam is real. The hell guaranteed to those who die without Jesus is real. Those things aren't imagined. I you know, like stories of the boogeyman that you tell your kids to make them act right, right. Without Christ, all men and women do face the very real righteous judgment of God because all sinned and all are condemned. But again, that's where the good news of Jesus' gift comes in. Jesus, gift, he brings justification. Not only in the hope of justification, but in the reality of it. The condemnation we're guaranteed in Adam is reversed through the justification we receive in Jesus. How so? It says here, Paul writes, through his righteous act. Through his righteous act, through the cross. See, back at the garden, Adam com uh, committed a terrible, tragic offense, an unrighteous act. And although we're not filled in on the rest of the details of Adam's life, we're only told of one sin he ever committed. Now, surely he committed a lot more, but only one is recorded for us. But that one sin affected the rest of humanity. And Paul's going to make that point explicit in verse 19. That one sin, that one offense is reversed through one man's righteous act. When Jesus died on the cross for us, his one death removes the sting from all death. The one offense that condemned all humanity was answered with Jesus at the cross and in his resurrection. So Jesus died the death that people were guaranteed to die. And of course, he offers life to those who receive him as Lord. Now, before we leave this verse in verse 18, we've got to ask a question. Are all people saved? When Paul writes that through Jesus' righteous act, that his gift came to all men, is Paul teaching universalism? After all, Adam's sin had a universal effect on humanity. Every single man and woman dies, period. Did Jesus' death and resurrection have a similar universal effect? Some people take Paul to mean exactly that, that the use of these parallel statements show that Jesus' act 
automatically affects all of humanity, just like Adam's sin automatically affected everyone. We need to be very, very careful because that is not Paul's point at all. Paul's statement in Romans 5.18 cannot be ripped from the context of the rest of the book of Romans. We need to remember that for the first three chapters in Romans, Paul shows that all people, Jew and Gentile, are sinners facing the judgment and the condemnation of God. And if we are thus condemned, yet automatically saved, why issue the warning? Why implore people to believe on Jesus? Why teach so much about justification by faith if faith is optional, if faith is unnecessary? No, Paul does not teach universalism one iota. This is clear from his opening thesis in the letter onward through the entire book. Just to give you a couple examples, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power of salvation to everyone who believes. Power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the, the Greek. And then Romans 10.9, that if you confess, notice the if, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What do these two statements have in common? Well, among other things, faith is essential. Without belief, we aren't saved. With belief, we are saved. Paul's not saying everybody's automatically saved in Romans 5.18. You have to believe to be saved. Please be very careful in biblical interpretation to keep Scripture in its context. We always want to uh, interpret a Scripture within its immediate context, what's on either side of it, then the context within the chapter, then the context within the book, then the context of how the writer talks about this concept throughout various other writings that he has, and then within the New Testament, and on and on and on, then broader, broader circles. Anyone can take any verse out of context and make it mean whatever it is they want it to mean, but then we've lost all meaning, yeah. right? It's only when we keep our interpretation within the biblical context that we can be assured of the correct interpretation. All right, now let's move on. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. It's the same basic idea as verse 18, just a little different perspective here. Adam's one sin, the singular act of disobedience, Jesus' cross, a singular act of obedience. One sin brought consequences on us all, made us all sinners. Jesus' act, one of many, but the preeminent act, of course, makes the righteousness of God available to all who believe. Jesus' obedience is our righteousness. We have none without Adam. So what does all this mean regarding the law? Remember that Adam sinned prior to the law of Moses, but the law once given, well, that still needs to be addressed. There is a law, so we've got to fulfill it somehow. Paul answers the question, by the way, before it's even asked. Verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. The law was given to identify sin. Sin certainly existed prior to the written law, as demonstrated by all those generations of death. But the moral law of God, although it was known, is not easily quantified. That's where the written law comes in. The law doesn't do away with sin. How can it? The law does identify sin. Someone says, well, the law comes so I can justify myself. No, that's not the reason why the law was given. No, the law is given to identify the perfect standard of God. So not only do you know you're falling short, but you know how short you're falling. Again, you can't justify yourself. Oh, I've done a good job keeping the law. That's not the reason the law was ever given in the first place. People want to justify themselves through good deeds and obedience, but that's never the purpose. The law is never given for people to show how good I've been. Oh, look at me. You know, a good Jewish person say, oh, I've been keeping the Sabbath every day. I got circumcised on the eighth day. I did all these things. Even people today, oh, I'm keeping the Sabbath today. That shows what a good person I am. Not so. Look at me loving my neighbor, evangelicals. Look at me giving my tithes the way I'm supposed to be doing. None of that proves goodness. It can't. And even if you haven't fallen short in one area, you've fallen short in another. And the area you think you didn't fall short in, you did anyway. Again, that's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to show us how short we've fallen. And that's how badly we need Jesus, is to take us to the feet of our Savior. The more we see our need for Christ, the tighter to Him we'll cling. So sin abounded through the law, because for the first time it can be really seen. But again, the gift is better. Grace abounds much more than, law, than the law. Grace abounds more than sin. Grace is greater than our sin. I love that hymn. Greater than our sin. 
The grace of Jesus covers all of our sin, past, present, and future, covers not only what we inherited from Adam, but it covers everything we've ever done. It'll cover everything we'll ever do. Grace is greater than the law. Although the law shows us our needs to be justified, it can't justify us, but the grace of Jesus can. Grace is greater. Verse 21, so that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because grace abounds, life abounds. No longer does death reign. Verse 14, death reigned. No longer. Now grace reigns. Throughout all eternity, throughout the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, the millions, the billions of years into the future, we will always live in the grace of Jesus Christ. Death has no more rule over us, but grace soaks into every aspect of our existence. Everything we have in Jesus is because of his grace. Justification from our original sin, forgiveness for our present day sins, and eternal deliverance from the very presence of sin. All of it's because of grace, all through the gift of Jesus. And these are very real results of Jesus' gift. They're amazing. Justification, abundant grace, eternal life, all through Christ. So what happened? What happened is we had a terrible problem because of Adam's sin. As our federal head, he passed sin and death down to us. What's our only hope? Our hope is the gift of Jesus. What he offers, that grace that saves us from condemnation, gives us justification, offers us the promise of reigning in life. And what actually then comes? What's the real result of Jesus' gift? Well, everything that he promised. It's not a maybe or perhaps. No, we have a solid promise of righteousness through Jesus' righteous act. We have this gift of grace that abounds to us much more than the sin that we've received from our fathers, and we have no doubt that we will live in the grace of Jesus and the promise of God for all eternity. This time of year we like to talk about Christmas gifts, but you can't get one better than this. What God gives us in Jesus is amazing. He gives us grace. Grace greater than our sin, grace greater than death, grace greater than condemnation. The gift of grace in Jesus is greater than everything. Christian, please consider the gift of grace you have in Jesus. It's amazing. It's, it's fantastic. It literally changes everything about us. It covers the, the sin that's at the core of our origin. It covers the condemnation we deserve. It covers and it changes our eternal future from death to life. There's nothing about you whatsoever which is not touched and transformed by the grace of Jesus. Do you rejoice in that gift? Do you walk and do you live, do you breathe Jesus' grace? Or do you do like so many others do, like I've been guilty of too, when we beat ourselves up as if our eternity depends on us? If we're honest, we do the latter far too often. Uh, you know, we pray the prayer and when we're asked, then we say, yes, I do trust Jesus for my forgiveness, my salvation. But when it comes to the daily grind, we live like we didn't receive a gift at all. Like we're still trying to earn God's favor. So we need to rejoice in the gift. You've been given a gift in Jesus. Now live like it. Stop beating yourself up for the sins you committed. Once you confess them to Christ, leave them in Christ. Live in His grace. Stop treating death like is something you greatly fear. If you truly belong to Jesus, you've got the promise of eternal life. Stop acting as if God has nothing for you but condemnation. He's always unhappy with me. Now, the promise of Jesus is that you've been justified. Too many times, born-again Christians carry the mindset of those who have never been born again. If you've received the gift, act like you received it. And if you can't, maybe you should ask yourself if you've ever received it in the first place. If you don't know the peace that's available through the gift of Jesus' grace, that may be a red flag saying you never received it in the first place. If you're constantly questioning whether or not God truly forgives you, maybe it's an indication you don't have assurance of that promise. You can be assured, but it's found only in Christ alone. You want to turn to Him in true faith and receive the gift that he offers you. And you can do that right now as we pray. Lord, we thank you so much for sending Jesus. And I thank you that he offers such a magnificent gift of grace. And I pray, Lord, that every single person here today will have received that gift, appropriate by faith, 
and know without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is good to his word. Shower us, Lord, with abundant grace and help us walk in the reality of it. Lord, for those who have not yet committed their lives to you, who have not yet received Jesus as Lord, I haven't turned to you and asked, please forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Lord, help them do that in this moment. Give them, Lord, the words that they need, the words that are bubbling up in their heart that, Lord, that will cry out to you to save them. And then as they do in this moment, give them the assurance that you hear through Jesus and you do shower them with grace. Thank you for your word, your promises, and your work. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.